So Jane Philpott, who resigned from her cabinet position over the SNC-Lavalin affair and then was kicked out of the Liberal caucus, is not finished with her fight. She now alleges the Prime Minister broke the law when he unilaterally booted her and Jody Wilson-Raybould out of the caucus. According to new parliamentary rules, of course, expelling members is supposed to be up to the caucus to decide. Parties can opt out of these rules with a vote at the beginning of the parliamentary session, but Philpott claims this didn't happen. The Speaker of the House, however, refused to rule on her claim, so what now? Is Dr. Jane Philpott going to continue on with her battle? Let's find out. Joining me now is Dr. Jane Philpott. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Tough times. It's been difficult. The Speaker ruled against you. You said, you alleged that uh, the Prime Minister broke the law when he did not ask caucus to vote to throw you out. Um, the Speaker said he couldn't rule on this. Um, what was your reaction to that? Do you still believe the Prime Minister broke the law? Well, Evan, it was uh, a difficult decision to actually uh, decide to rise on that question of privilege. I had a limited amount of time in which I could do it, but I decided in the end that it was important to do it. This is not about trying to further cause uh, uh, alarm or trouble for my former colleagues, but this was a, a fundamental principle about due process for members of parliament and the approach by which they can be expelled. And so it's a matter of the public record that the Liberal Party didn't hold the votes that the law says need to be held to decide whether or not the Prime Minister has the authority to expel or that it is done by a vote of caucus. They, they by the way, press back and say, yes, there is the Canada Parliament Act, but they didn't take the subsequent four votes that would essentially implement it. And then the Prime Minister argued still he had tested the will of caucus. And the will of caucus was goodbye Jane Philpott, goodbye Jody Wilson-Raybould. Right. So, you know, one can argue that the will of caucus was uh, followed in, in the Prime Minister's decision, but the law is quite clear that there shall be four votes. Uh, and as I say, it's a matter of pu public record that the votes didn't occur. So that was that's problematic in and of itself. The outcome probably would have been the same in the end. They would. You think your your former colleagues probably. would have said, "See I, that's you later." That's the sense I'm Go I'm ahead. getting is that a majority would have probably voted for us to be have it be expelled. But this isn't about me. This is about all members of parliament. In particular, I think it's hopefully going to be helpful for future members of parliament that they would have those rights respected and that due process would occur, that those votes would take place at the beginning because we come to Ottawa to represent our constituents. We have to be able to have a fair voice and if one is going to give power to the leader of a party to expel unilaterally, then that should be a decision that members of a party should give to the Prime Minister and it should not be taken unilaterally. Fair point. Uh, although Andrew Scheer, I think when he threw out Tony Clement, didn't take a vote. Jagmeet Singh didn't take a vote with Aaron Weir when he threw him out. Threw Some him of out. these have, in the case of, of uh, Tony Clement, I believe, uh, resigned, uh, resigned. Uh, the detail. So that's, that's different than being expelled. Uh, your colleagues have said you're not a team player. You're attention seeking. I'm quoting some of them. Um, and that when you rose on this point, it was like, let it go. You are, you, the team that you once worked for, you are now actively trying to destroy. And they regard the righteousness that you have, and to a certain extent, Jody Wilson-Raybould, as a mask for what they regard as political naivety. Why would she think we would keep her in a party when she said she has no belief in the integrity and morality of the Prime Minister in an election year? She's openly taken the party down. It's naive to think they would keep you in the party. Well, first of all, thank you for giving me a chance to clarify some of those accusations and, and what I think are misunderstandings. You know, I have, people have said that this is some kind of attention-seeking behavior. You know, I have hundreds of journalists from around the world that want like yourself that want to know my opinion on things so uh, you know I would have a choice to potentially muzzle myself and and never speak when someone sticks a microphone in my face or never respond to to journalists who are trying to help share stories um, but to a certain extent I need to have opportunities to be able to defend the decisions I've made and to say this is not about trying to attack the government in any way I think I've been quite clear about the fact that I wish the Prime Minister the very best that I I still fundamentally support the liberal policies and the platform that I ran on but 
I needed to stand up on a point of principle that um, I did not receive due process in the expulsion. And as I say, I, I, I knew that they probably wouldn't, that it w the outcome would not be any different. But this is not fair for future members of Parliament if on a whim a leader of a party decides that they want to expel a caucus member and those votes had never taken place. Uh, members of Parliament are accountable to our constituents. The leader is accountable to members of Parliament. But go back to the previous, what caused the rupture. When you decided to stand with Jody Wilson-Raywell, the former Attorney General, and resign, and, and you talked to McLean's Magazine and others about it, and you said you essentially have lost confidence in the Cabinet team. You couldn't sit around there as a point of, of principle. Didn't you know at that point that this would be an indictment of the Prime Minister and hurt the, the Liberal Party. So I understand there's a point of principle, but when the Liberal government has argued, look, Jody Wilson-Raybould said there's nothing illegal here. We had heard the Justice Committee for, testify for four hours. What they were doing now was for whatever reason, whatever your motivations, tearing down the Prime Minister and you want the Prime Minister's head. That is absolutely untrue. I made it very clear that I supported the Prime Minister. I still wish him the very best. I supported the party. I said that right up until the day that I was expelled from caucus. The reason I had to resign from Cabinet is that in Cabinet you have a unique responsibility, something called Cabinet Solidarity, which means that even uh, if you may have had disagreements in the privacy of the Cabinet room, once you go out in front of the world, you have to speak with one mind and, and have solidarity. I would have had then to defend what had taken place when I knew that there was significant evidence of attempts to interfere with a very important criminal trial. I couldn't go out in good conscience and defend that, so I said I'm going to just step down because I'm not satisfied with this particular issue and how it's being dealt with, so my obligation is to step down. I then could have done one of two things. We could have agreed to disagree because it's absurd to think that every caucus member thinks the very same about right. every single issue. Right. And in fact, caucus members have an obligation to hold the government to account and should be free to disagree on, on one or two issues as long as we accept the, the broad principles and we agree to support the government in a budget bill, etc. Um, you know, we could have agreed to disagree. I also raised alternate suggestions about, you know, maybe at some point it would be helpful to put this issue aside by saying, you know what, something went wrong, we're sorry, uh, we'll make sure it doesn't happen again. That path was never chosen. Did you specifically ask the Prime Minister, we will stay in caucus, Jody wilson able or myself, if you simply apologize? From, did, you, did you say that to him? From the day that I resigned from Cabinet on March 4th until the day I was called into the Prime Minister's office on April 2nd, I did not have a single conversation or a single outreach from the Prime Minister. Why would an apology make a difference? If it was a matter of principle and law, what, why, would a, why would an apology matter if, if you were concerned about the ethics of uh, the allegations of political interference in the independence of the judiciary? Well, something took place that I think was very concerning. We have to uphold the independence of the justice system in this country. It can't be arbitrary, and politicians certainly can't try to inter interfere with criminal trials and decide who goes to court or who gets convicted. If we start doing that, we will we will lose the very core of our democracy. I feel that there is good evidence, and it's on the public record now, that something went wrong, and there were attempts to interfere. Did you know that at that the time, needs, Dr. Philpa? Did you know at the, like was this something that you found out as you know when the globe broke the story or was there was this something that was boiling for a long time and you thought because now that we've seen the documents Ms. Uh, Wilson Raybould has talked uh, the conversation with the clerk of the Privy Council she alleges there was a boiling pot from September all the way up until her resignation were you aware of it that whole time? So I can't tell you about the conversations that I had that are covered by cabinet confidentiality that I may or may not have had with the former Attorney General, for example. But I will say that there is a clue for Canadians that comes from the testimony of Gerald Butts at, to the Justice Committee when he said that on January 6th, when the Prime Minister 
t asked me to to change positions and become the president of the Treasury right. Board. He also told me about plans to shuffle the former Attorney General, and it was a matter of Mr. Butt's testimony that I raised then with the Prime Minister my concern uh, that this could be seen to be associated with what was going on on the Deferred Prosecution Agreement and SNC Lavalin. So. That's as much as I can say, but obviously there must have been some reason why I said that. Can you, did you ever try to broker a deal? And did you ever ask any members of the Prime Minister's office or the Prime Minister if they, if the Prime Minister would fire, let go, or move members of his inner circle that you and Jody Wilson-Raybould would stay? Did you ever ask someone to be removed from office? So once again, I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to clarify that because I think that part of that story from uh, leaks, uh, presumably from the Prime Minister's office to various news outlets, um, are, are just that. They were leaks. The conversations that may have been associated with any of that from my part, and I can't speak for the former Attorney General, are conversations that were a matter of cabinet confidentiality, and I'm not at liberty to be able to, to share my so what version do you think of about that. that. Because well, we've heard that, that Jody Wilson Rabel, and frankly, sources have told me that you also said, got to remove this person and this person, and then we'll come back into the fold. That there was some kind of brokerage negotiating going on. And, and in this back and forth, the Prime Minister didn't, although Mr. Butts ended up resigning and Mr. Wernick ended up resigning, I understand that. But was it that, I'm just trying to get a sense of, I, of the jostling. I'm happy to respond as much as I can. And okay. what I will say is I think that the characterization of, of any conversations that may have happened, it is unfair for Canadians to only hear from a leaked source how conversations are characterized. I am not at liberty to be able to share any of those same conversations that may have been leaked to you. Those were private, one-on-one -on -one conversations. I have an oath to the Queen to not tell you what took place in those conversations. Someone else has told you their version of those conversations. I think that's uh, an unfair circumstance to be in. There's nothing much I can do about it, except I would just say that, that Canadians should question when a leaked source only gives one version of what took place. Are you pursuing a, a way, a forum, to talk about this? The Justice Committee has been shut down. Would you like an opportunity to clarify that in the proper forum? You know, everything I uh, do to try to do the right thing in this, Evan, gets uh, kind of misunderstood. And I, at this point, feel like there is no, I don't think there's value in me uh, trying to pursue uh, any way to get any more information out. I think Canadians have enough information to know what took place. But you said there was more to the story. You told well, Paul Wells of McLean's, and it was fascinating. You said there's more to the story. You know what? So now Canadians Does are it, like, okay, is there more or is it done? What I will say is that I think there is enough information out there already on the public record for Canadians to see and judge for themselves what they believe happened as to whether or not the evidence points to attempts to interfere in a criminal trial. Jane Philpott, when the Prime Minister stood up when, the, when this story broke and said this story is false, was he telling the truth? I think that those statements need to be measured against the evidence that is now on the public record. Was it a truthful statement? Well, there were specific allegations in the Globe and Mail that were for later borne out uh, through testimony at the Justice Committee to have actually taken place. When Jody Wilson-Raybould said nothing illegal was done, I mean, she's at committee, was something illegal done? No. Was there a moment where you said, well, I mean, I understand they're trying to figure out when to use this deferred prosecution agreement. There's back and forth, the Prime Minister, the clerk all say, you know, it's an instrument that we believe we were just talking to her about. She says nothing illegal happened. Did that make you question whether or not this rose to the threshold that you would resign from your cabinet position? So, again, um, you're absolutely right that the, the former Attorney General uh, spoke about the fact that there was no evidence of anything illegal. What concerned me, though, was not whether or not something illegal had taken place, but something very um, unethical and damaging, potentially, to the independence and the integrity of the justice system. Our democracy is designed such that there are various branches of government. One of them is that independent justice system. You and I don't want 
uh, if a fam one of our family members was assaulted in some way, we don't want that person who was the uh, perpetrator to be able to call up their buddy who may be a politician who can then intervene in the trial and but say, don't that send happen? that person to but, trial. But I guess the, the, the government's arguing that didn't happen. We have a deferred prosecution agreement. It was talked about in the last budget. And it's an instrument that is used around the world. And this is how it's worked. Do you, the you, issue you, is, you find that a, a, well, risk, the, a, a not a fair characterization? That's not what the issue is here. Okay. This is not about whether a deferred prosecution agreement is a good idea or whether this particular one was a good idea. That decision was made by the director of public prosecutions who said, not whether or not it's a good idea, but said they do not qualify. This company does not qualify. The decision was made. And for politicians then to try to pressure the Attorney General to, uh, Attorney General to overrule the Director of Propl Prosecutions, that's where we see the evidence of an attempt to interfere. Did you ever question the ethics of Jody Wilson-Raybould taping the conversation with the Clerk of the Privy Council, uh, Mr. Warnick? She taped that conversation on December 19th. She did not reveal it in subsequent meetings with the Prime Minister, in subsequent meetings with the Prime Minister's staff. She did not reveal it in her four-hour testimony at the Justice Committee. She held it back. Did, should she have revealed that if she was so concerned about the situation earlier before she took the job as the Minister of Veterans Affairs? And does the ethics of that and the fact that it was not revealed till much later bother you or change your calculation? Well, as I have, uh, others have said before, the reasons for why that conversation was taped are well documented. The former Attorney General has put that information in some of the uh, materials that she submitted to the justice system. Uh, the fact that she felt unsafe and had to uh, make that recording for her own records and also to protect herself. People should be far less concerned with whether or not she uh, proceeded to do what was legal to record that. They should be concerned about what is said in that conversation. But you, can do, you can be concerned about both. I think well, we you can. I think but we're I, really I, concerned about what was said. There's been hearings about it, but it's fair to also ask about that too. Well, I think that, that legal experts have made it very clear that it is perfectly legal and legitimate thing to do, and under the circumstances and under the pressure, the extraordinary situation that the former AG found herself in, uh, that it was an unusual thing to do, but reasonable under those circumstances. Did you know she had taped it? And I have to ask you, given that, given the fact that you were aware of all this, did you ever tape any conversations because of that extraordinary situation? I can't think of any that would be similar to that. You, did, you didn't tape conversations? I, I sometimes, when I'm talking to journalists, tape it. So That's if I made no, a no, misquote. So we're, we're taping it too. <laughs> but, but no, you, I you have don't nothing. Tape I, you have not, quote, secretly taped a conversation. I, as I say, the only conversations that I have records of are the uh, conversations that I have with journalists. Could you, if you were not kicked out, right now, could you vote for Justin Trudeau? As leader of the party? Yeah, and I, the I'm not one of his constituents. So. No, I understand that, but, uh, but Andrew Scheer is out there saying he's lost the moral authority to govern, he should resign. Has Justin Trudeau lost the moral authority to lead the country? I have an enormous amount of respect for our Prime Minister. I think he has done an incredible job leading this country, has moved it forward in positive, many positive ways. I have some decisions to make in the next few weeks as to whether or not I will uh, run again federally. At the moment, the door is closed for me running as a Liberal. I have been approached by people of other parties uh, and am weighing those options. So uh, my vote in the upcoming federal election is uh, not yet decided. Let's talk about that. Have the NDP formally approached you and asked you to be a candidate? I have had conversations. With them. And has the Green Party as well? Yeah. Yes. Both, both the Greens and the NDP have approached you. Are, is, is it something you're seriously considering? Are those options that, are, of course they're happening, but Jane Philpott, are you seriously considering running either for the Greens, the NDP, or the Conservatives? I, what I've said up to now is that I have not closed any doors. I have a range of options. Obviously, I could leave politics altogether and go back to do, do you medicine want to do that? or something. You know, I, there are moments when I'm very tempted to do that because this has not been a particularly pleasant experience of recent weeks. Uh, but you know what? Two, two reasons why I'm seriously considering running again. One uh, is that I stood up and 
said what I believed, tried to advance the truth, tried to stand up on principle and say that I was concerned about something and have, was a, essentially pushed away as a result of that. Um, if people that are trying to do the right thing and standing up for truth and justice get pushed away and leave politics forever, I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. So I, I'd like to think that I could stay at it. And the second thing is that, you know, I need to listen to my constituents and my family, but my constituents are telling me that they still want me to represent them. And so if there's some other path that I can find, um, I will be sitting down with um, my volunteers and many others doing some door knocking over the next couple of weeks, hear what people say, if they would support me again, and if so, under what uh, banner. So okay, we'll, so I'll let you know. You're seriously considering green or NDP, I not could also, I could also run as an independent. I, I wouldn't, at this point, uh, okay, I think it, there are too many policy differences uh, with the Conservatives. Or an independent, okay. Last question for you. In all this, and it's been, a, I mean, your political career has been a kind of rocket ship that's come down for a pretty hard landing. What's been, the, what was the most hurtful moment in all this? What was the toughest moment? Um, I would say, in general, the the tough times have been when people have said cruel things, which, you know, I guess we all get to hear cruel things, but particularly when I feel that they have been unfair accusations and that I have not had any avenue to explain my rationale for any of the decisions that I've made. So a, a certain measure some of, of misunderstanding. Some of your colleagues, the things that people have said about you, that, that must yeah, have been. Yeah, I, I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. Um, I, I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to be a good member of parliament for the people of Markham Stouffville. And any regrets, Jane Philpott? Do you, like if now, given what's happened, given what Justin Trudeau said, do you have any regrets now think, you know what, we could have brokered something. We could have done this differently. It didn't have to end like this. Yeah. Is there any, was there any way for this not to end with you kicked out of the caucus? Well, let me first of all clarify, there were no serious attempts to broker a resolution to this. So that should be clear. There were no on, on my attempts? part. On my part, for I can't speak for Prime Mr. Minister Wilson didn't call you in. No, nobody said, "Hey, maybe what, we got a difference of opinion." Majority Wilson Raybould. Nobody said, "Jane Philpott, come on in, figure it out. Maybe you can stay." Nothing. No. That's surprising. That's the truth. There were con I had very kind colleagues, former Liberal colleagues, who called me. I had, you know, probably half a dozen people that I had phone calls with. But you didn't, and, call, I, and before you were kicked out, of, you didn't have, didn't you raise? I know you can't talk about cabinet, but didn't you raise it and say, guys, they, we're going to walk out the door if you don't fin fix this? You didn't speak truth to power in cabinet to the prime minister, saying this is a breaking point. You're going to lose a couple ministers here. I had conversations before I resigned from right. cabinet to attempt uh, to. Uh, see if there was a way that I wouldn't have to resign. Those I can't give details of those, but there, at that stage, up and up right. into the March fourth, there were conversations um, of what might have made it possible for me to not have to resign. But from the time of resignation until the time uh, of being kicked out of caucus, there were I, I did not have any conversations with the prime minister. Anyway, but any regret? I mean, but interesting. But interesting. You talked to the PM before March that that date, mm -hmm. and there was a tense, and you guys could not reach a way to figure this out. Uh, there did not come to a point where I felt that I could continue to uh, be in solidarity with the approach that was being taken. So on the regret. On the regret, I mean, I regret that the whole thing going back to the fall of 2018 happened. I mean, that would have been awesome if, if those, that series of uh, attempts to influence the former AG had never happened. That would have been the, the best case scenario. Um, I regret that the shuffle took place. I don't regret that I stepped down from cabinet because I have to, at the end of the day, live with myself, live with my, my children and be able to say I did the right thing. I, you know, of course I would have loved to stay on as a cabinet minister. It was an amazing opportunity and I felt I had something to contribute there. But I couldn't do so if it meant that I had to go out and talk to people like you and not speak what I thought was the truth. I gotta leave it there. Jane Philpott, I may see you after October. We'll find we'll out. We'll see. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank you. It.